Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Secure 9000 Integration with the Stonelock Biometric Security and Authentication. My name is Kelsey Burke. I'm the Product Manager for OEM Solutions here at Warehouse. With me today, I have Greg Harmon, the Director of Regional Sales North America for Stonelock, as well as Yannick Brunet, the General Manager and Vice President of Marketing, also with Stonelock. Today's webinar will be talking about the new Stonelock Go Reader, along with the integration of the unit with our Secure 9000 access control system. Before we dive in, just a few housekeeping rules as we move through today's presentation. Everyone has entered in listen-only mode, but we will be taking questions throughout the presentation today. So please utilize the questions pane uh, so we may answer any questions as we're moving along in today's presentation, as well as the short demo we have. Also, this webinar is being recorded. So at the conclusion of today's webinar, we will be sending the recording out to all attendees. So if you have any colleagues or um, individuals that were hoping to join today's call and are unable to do so, we will be providing uh, today's session in a recording to be shared out at a later date. So without much more delay, I will go ahead and pass the reins over to Greg so we can begin diving in. Perfect, well, thank you very much, Kelsey. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just do a quick introduction of myself and then I'll allow uh, Yannick to introduce himself. So as Kelsey said, uh, I'm uh, the Regional Director of Sales with Stonelock. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background on myself, I spent the majority of my career actually at Tyco Security Products. So, um, you know, our relationship with Software House is very near and dear to both Yannick and I's heart because that's where we spent the, the vast majority of our careers. And uh, we're really proud of not just the product we're going to show you today, but the, the partnership that we have with Software House and the integration that we built together. So um, that's the intro on me. I'll let, I'll let Yannick do an introduction uh, on himself. <laughs> well, you took, pretty much, you took pretty much all my points, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hope everybody has a good coffee going. It's hard to imagine people sitting in their home office or in their, you know, in their kitchen at this point. You know, uh, as I get ready for these calls now, it's it's just a, a different mind shift that I have to do before we get going. But uh, wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us. We're extremely excited. Uh, what you're seeing today is the culmination of uh, 18 months of hard work by the team. Uh, and uh, we couldn't be happier to be uh, in such a strong position together with Software House. I think we're going to do great things together. Uh, so um, I guess let's get going. Let's do it. All right. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, we've been up to a lot to Yannick's point over the last 18 months. We've, we've pr pretty much gone back to the drawing board and reimagined uh, what facial biometrics can be. Uh, and we're going to take you through uh, what we come up with today. Um, we'll take you, uh, we basically, we've, we've re-engineered our, our hardware from the ground up, our software from the ground up, our SDK and our integration packages with, with Software House. And, uh, and we'll take you through a, a demo here that'll be a live demo. Um, just to give you a little bit of background for those who are not familiar with, uh, with Stonelock, we are a, uh, or we, I should say we have been since 2011, we have been a leader in the facial biometric space. Uh, we are uh, a uh, uh, U.S. Uh, owned and founded uh, business. Uh, something that I think we're really proud of is we are doing all of our engineering, development, QA, tech support, ownership, and even manufacturing all onshore. Uh, so we're doing all of that within the United States and Canada. Um, so for those that, that don't know us, so what, what Stonelock has really prided ourselves on since 2011 has been our approach to privacy and security. Um, so from a privacy standpoint, and we get this uh, in the news all the time, you know, California and, and Illinois, they talk about facial recognition and uh, there's a lot of controversy about it. And uh, I think it's important as we, we kind of go into this product discussion for everybody to understand what they're talking about and what we do, because they're very different things. Uh, facial authentication for biometric is what we do, uh, and facial recognition uh, more describes a, a camera being pointed in a public space. You know, Yannick walks in front of the camera, and then I, I can label, okay, that's Yannick, and the next time Yannick walks in front of him, we can generate an alert uh, or send a notification uh, or, or do a video pop-up, that kind of thing. Um, what we are doing is quite different from that. You know, in that 
relationship that was not consensual. Yannick did not consent to being onboarded. Uh, with us, we are uh, consensual. Uh, users will have to um, uh, enroll in our platform. So they're going to need to consent and enroll in order to be uh, uh, authorized or authenticated, I should say, uh, by our platform. Um, also, from a privacy standpoint, we'll talk about this a lot more in the next slide, but we don't store any photographs or, or any videos of users enrolling or authenticating. All we're going to store is a biometric key, and I'll touch more on that in the next uh, in the next slide. Um, from a security standpoint, uh, we are also different from those, you know, pointed camera at a public space. Uh, those are using visible light, uh, and what we're doing is we're working in the non-visible spectrum. We're working in the near-infrared spectrum. So what we do is we, we flood a user's face, face with near infrared light, we watch how that absorbs in the skin, and then we run our analysis on what reflects back to our sensor. Um, so from a security standpoint, uh, our product has been, a, uh, our, our way of doing this, our science has been around since 2011, and we have uh, to date no recorded cases of spoofing. Nobody's able, been able to use a, a 3D printed mask or a picture of a user in order to trick it into thinking it's somebody it's not. Uh, but the, the, the thing we're going to do and the reason we're going to do a live demo for you is we want to show you how easy we have made this. And, and uh, I think that we have made managing biometrics actually easier than managing physical credentials. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a demo and would love to hear your, your feedback in the, uh, in the question section. From that standpoint, Greg, uh, you know, I've been in, in the industry for over 25 years and uh, for the last 20 at least, uh, this year was going to be the year of biometrics and somehow it never happened. And I think one of the main reasons it didn't happen is because the technology was so difficult to uh, to implement and make work. Uh, it was very difficult to operate for the end users. So, you know, it got to the point where we could do a pretty convincing demo in a boardroom, but when it got to deployment and, and, and giving the reins over to an end user, it was a very difficult experience. And I can tell you right now uh, that pro this product is uh, far beyond anything that's ever been done in that space. Uh, it's as simple as it could be, and uh, and I think you'll see that in the next uh, next few minutes here. So the section that we're going to look at uh, in order to authenticate a, a user, and and I should maybe start with with kind of explaining that process a little bit. What we're going to do at a very high level is we're going to try and take your face and turn it into a card. So, so basically when a user approaches our device, what we want to do is we want to match that to our database of biometric keys and then take that user's card number that's associated with that key and pass it down to the iStart panel. Uh, that's what we're doing. So we don't make any decisions. Uh, we're not granting access or, or denying access or anything like that. All we are doing is authenticating a user and then we're allowing uh, Secure to know who that user is so that they can decide whether or not to unlock the door for them. Uh, to do that, we're going to be looking at a very small section of the user's face. Uh, as you can see in the, the diagram there, it's just uh, above that, that bottom or the upper lip there and just above the eyebrows. Uh, we're looking there because that is going to be the part of the face that remains the most consistent. Uh, as users you know, come in in hard hats or ball caps, if people grow beards and shave, um, this part is going to remain consistent. It's going to give us a, a small, small area to, uh, to analyze so that we can make sure that uh, users are consistently getting through a door and, and uh, not being denied access. On this slide, we always get two questions. Uh, the first question is, do you support glasses? And we were getting those questions for a while. And then in February, we started getting a second question, which you guys can probably guess. Um, the glasses question is, yes, we do support glasses. So I'm going to do a demo for you and I'm going to show you how we do it. Uh, we do a, it's, it's a, uh, two-step enrollment process. So uh, as I as I go through enrollment, it'll actually pause halfway through and instruct me how to enroll myself with glasses. Uh, so we do support uh, uh, glasses. Uh, the second question that we started getting since February was, do you support masks? And if anybody on the phone is using or on on the uh, call is using their phone to or their face to unlock their phone, uh, you'll know know that you have to pull your mask down in order for it to uh, unlock. We are no different. Uh, the, the masks introduce a lot of variability uh, and we're not supporting uh, masks at this time. It's something we're working on, but uh, something that we've not, not quite cracked just yet. Um, so what we're gonna do is a user approaches our device. We're not looking at visible light. We're looking at near infrared. We look at how that user reflects back to our, our sensor. We run thousands of calculations on a very small section of their, of their near infrared reflection and always stores the calculations. 
for a user now to be authenticated in our system, they're going to have to approach our device. We're going to run those same calculations, and then we're going to match those calculations against our, our database of biometric keys. Uh, so from a privacy standpoint, uh, what we capture is not a photograph or a video or anything that can be reverse engineered into uh, a photo of a user. As you can see in, in the middle there, we take those calculations and we assign color values to them to show you that uh, what we capture is not something that you can turn around and say, oh, that's Yannick. <clears throat> so this is the new hardware. Uh, we have a, a nice uh, matte black trim around the outside. Uh, the material on the face of it, you can't really tell there, but it's it's piano black. Uh, we have a near-infrared cluster up here at the top. Uh, our our, uh, our sensor is actually embedded in behind the piano black finish on the front, so you don't see it, but it's it's kind of hidden back, back in there. Uh, and then we have this really nice big bite display, and uh, we actually have a QR code reader also embedded in the face of the device. So what we're going to do uh, with this display is, uh, if you think about how you enrolled your biometric on your phone, for, for most of the people on this call, uh, chances are you, you got the phone the first day and you unlocked it, and then all of a sudden the screen came to life and it just started walking you through self-enrollment prompts. And you probably didn't need Apple's Genius Bar or, or Geek Squad or any of that stuff to figure out how to get your biometric into the system. We are going to do the same thing with our display. Um, we are going to use a, a process that we call first read enrollment. So to get a user into the system, all they're going to have to do is present the card that was assigned to them in Secure. Uh, the screen will come to life automatically. So if, if, if I'm not enrolled in the system and I present my card uh, for the first time and it's going to come to life and say this user hasn't, hasn't been enrolled, the screen will come to life, walk them through an 18 second process, and then the user is going to be able to authenticate on any reader on the system. It's a completely different way of thinking about biometrics because the, the typical workflow there is a user uh, will show up. So I'm going to enroll Yannick. Yannick will show up. I'm going to uh, open up software. I'm going to find Yannick in the software. And then I'm going to find a, a device that I want to enroll Yannick on. A lot of times it has to be a dedicated enrollment station, not with us. I'm going to click start. I'm going to walk Yannick over there. I'm going to teach him how to get his biometric into the system. And then I'm going to go back to the software and I'm going to download Yannick into all the different devices where I want him to be able to authenticate. All of those steps go away. The user that exists for Yannick in, in Secure, we know what his card number is. So when Yannick presents that card, our screen will come to life, walk him through the enrollment. And 18 seconds later, he starts his day. There is no software to be touched, not just on the, uh, on the stone lock side, but also on the, uh, on the Secure side. So there is a second way to do this. Uh, so that, that, that's great for customers that are doing card plus face, um, but what about use, uh, uh, environments where customers just want to do face only, which is becoming increasingly popular. People just want to use their face to unlock the door. Certain users, they don't want to actually have to issue cards to. Well, we have a QR code reader embedded in the face of the device. So as soon as you create that profile inside of Secure, we will automatically email that user a unique QR code. And now when Yannick shows up, uh, they're just going to say, uh, hey, I have this email uh, telling me I need to come see you to enroll. Uh, and then I'll go, no problem. Can you open it up? Can you show me the QR code? Perfect. Show it to the device, follow the prompts on the screen, and uh, go through the enrollment process. So with that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump over to a, a live demo of the, uh, of the enrollment process and, uh, and show you what that looks like. And Yannick will, will commentate as we go through here. So I'm going to go into Secure. I'm running version uh, 2.8 here. And uh, I'm going to put in my name. <clears throat> so just the normal steps you would do to, to create a user in here. Uh, I'm going to put in a card number, put in a facility code. Um, I'm going to go over to uh, the web and mobile section, and I'm also going to put in I'm also going to put in my email address, and I'm going to hit save. So. As soon as I go back, excuse me, as, as soon as I go into the Stonelock interface, and these are mirrors of one another, as you can see there, as soon as I hit that save button, we went from a list with Yannick, Mitch, Ken, and Ed to a list with Yannick, Mitch, Ken, Ed, and Greg. So as soon as I hit that save button inside of Secure, uh, that user is going to be brought down into Stonelock in real time. Uh, literally within within a second, as you just saw, I pop over. You know, if you look at how this traditionally has worked, we're we're waiting for a polling sequence to kick in. You know, it could be 30 minutes, and then you know the polling sequence kicks in, and we do a full database synchronization. That's not what we're doing here. 
Uh, we're listening to Secure. If, if we hear that a change has occurred, we're going to pull just that change down. And, and so that, that whole process works in, in real time. Um, the other thing that occurred there, and uh, let me just pull back a little bit, is I received uh, a QR code, um, an enrollment email, also uh, as soon as I hit that save button. So nothing touched inside of Stonelock, and I, re and I received that, uh, that email. I'm going to turn my screen off so you can see this a little bit bigger. Does that work? And I'll pop back to the back of the room. All right. So, uh, so as Greg was saying, if a user has car a card already, you could use a card for this process. And if uh, the user doesn't, then in case of a visitor, uh, the user would use a QR code that's automatically emailed to them after the the operator uh, creates his profile and secure. So you notice now that uh, Greg cannot verify. So he's standing in front of both his readers, and he's not getting uh, valid verification. So Greg presented his uh, QR code and the reader just uh, came to life because this was deemed an enrollment reader uh, that's programmed in the reader itself. And uh, the reader would tell Greg, stay at arm's length, put on your stone lock face, and if you have glasses, keep them on. There's a little blue circle that comes down the screen that just keeps the attention of the user on the screen. And then halfway through the enrollment, the reader will say, if you have glasses, take them off. Uh, the rest of the enrollment takes place. Now we're blinking the little thing, and at the end of it all, uh, we have an enrollment that has been uh, finalized. So, and notice how Greg is already verifying. And Greg could not run fast enough to the other reader <laughs> before that reader is also authenticating. And that, that's what you would expect everywhere across all the readers on the system. So if audio was on, this is where we'd hear the, the ooh and was, but we'll have to do it ourselves, but pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so quite a bit different than the way that, uh, like my whole history in the security industry, like I, I've not seen a biometric work this this simply. Uh, the, the, the whole enroll, enrollment process, people love the idea of biometrics and then they'll get them installed and they realize, wow, there's a lot of uh, management operational effort required to get this thing managed. And also, the other thing that uh, Yann pointed out there is, I enrolled on this device and then I walked over to the device next to it and uh, my biometric was already loaded on there by the time I walked over. So like a second later, I'm over there, I'm loaded and it's ready to authenticate me locally at the device level without an administrator having to touch anything. When with biometrics users are getting, you know, denied access at doors, a lot of times it's because an administrator, you know, they might have uh, got the biometric in properly, but they didn't go back to the software and download that to the device properly, you know, to make sure they were at all the doors they needed to authenticate on. So all that goes away with uh, with us. Couple of questions uh, from Ken. Thank you, Ken, for your questions. One, uh, is there a Mullion size version available? No, this is the this is as small as we make it for now. Uh, we are working on. Uh, different versions, but uh, this is what's available right now. And uh, is this designed as one uh, for placement of Prox or iClass readers? Uh, so we can use it to replace those readers, or we can use it in conjunction with those readers to seamlessly transition customers from uh, the card to card and face or face only. And we'll talk about uh, the design of the system when that comes to play. So the short answer is this one reader will work with any readers out there together with the RAM. And, and, and we'll cover that uh, in a slide. Thanks again for the questions. Perfect. So, I mean, I just did a, a demo for you. I did show a little bit of our interface, um, but the, the whole intention, like we spent a lot of time in making that look really uh, slick and making it really simple to, to navigate. But our whole intention is you're just gonna live inside a secure. So there's a single pane of glass, you're gonna do all of your management, uh, uh, a user is created, uh, they can enroll without having to actually touch either software, uh, and then any uh, additions, deletions, edits uh, will all be reflected in Stonelock in real time. Um, also, the uh, the reader, as these two are, they're mounted at 48 inches uh, to, the, to the bottom of the device, uh, and so at four feet, we're actually uh, ADA compliant from a height spectrum standpoint. We're able to capture users that are seven feet tall as, user, as well as users in a wheelchair. <clears throat> so, uh, as I mentioned there, uh, in the enrollment process, I enrolled on, uh, you know, reader one here, I've got a reader on the left, I enroll on that reader, and then if I have 100 readers on the system, 
our gateway will automatically take care of, of pulling that, uh, that biometric key and broadcasting it to all of the other readers in real time. So for the vast majority of deployments, we're going to store, if, if you have a, a database up to 10,000 users, we're gonna store all 10,000 users biometrics locally at every single device level. Meaning if the and, networks, oh, sorry, go ahead. And we're gonna do that with the card numbers as well. One thing that's interesting there too, is we figured out a way to download the proper card based on, uh, on uh, the system programming. What I mean by that is, we'll make sure that the cards we bring in are the card that match the reader in terms of its output and and the type of card range. So if you're dealing with multiple types of cards, we'll make sure that the card number we pull is automatically the right one for that user for that door. So yeah. you don't have to touch any of those cards uh, as you uh, as you program the system. One click in, uh, in uh, Secure, you save it, and if the user has their own card, they enroll. So there's no need for anything else. That's yeah. up until uh, 10,000 users. And then after that. <laughs> and then after that. So so yeah. So what that means for those ten thousand users is that all of the the heavy lifting, the authentication is going to be happening at the device. So so from an availability standpoint, network can be down, server could be offline. You're still able to authenticate and gain entry. Uh, so from a reliability uh, and and online standpoint, um, from a users over ten thousand. So let's say I uh, I enroll uh, at at one reader. You know it broadcasts me out. Uh, you know up to ten thousand readers. But then we get into a database in excess of 10,000. So now I become user 10,001 on a reader. Uh, what we do there is when I present my face to this reader over here, let's say it's in the uh, New York office. I've never been to the New York office. It's my first time there. And there's already 10,000 biometric users that have used that reader. Um, what we will do is, you know, within the first about quarter of a second, we're gonna realize we don't recognize this person. They're not locally at the device. So we will send the request up to the gateway and we'll do the authentication there. Okay, we're not local, this user is not local on, on the device. Is the user uh, uh, available at the gateway level? And if the answer is yes, we will authenticate that user. The experience to the user is, is pretty transparent. They don't really realize whether they're being authenticated at the device or at the gateway, it, it's that fast. And then what will happen is that user's biometric will be pulled down into the reader and then the user furthest away from most recent to authenticate at that reader will be removed from it. So basically, instead of managing this based on you know uh, access levels, because it's not the most efficient way to manage which biometrics should be which in, in, in which reader, our, uh, our gateway will do smart in, smart out, and it will automatically manage which users should be at, uh, at which reader. So we have a, a few questions coming up on the, on the readers uh, we're compatible with, uh, the wiring and all of that. So we'll, we'll get to those, those answers in a minute here. Uh, okay. I just want to let people know that we're, we're keeping an eye. Yep. No, that's perfect. Actually, uh, the wiring and all that uh, is, is, is all coming up here in the next couple of slides. So um, from a, a, an install standpoint, uh, so this is where we get more into the specifics on how these get installed. Uh, like I said before, it's mounted at 48 inches. Um, we are working in the near infrared spectrum, so it is it is vital that these get installed in the in the right environments. So the, us working in the near infrared spectrum, uh, the conflict that we have is that when we put these devices uh, in an, in an outdoor setting, even if it's under an awning and it's protected, you know, from a, a you know getting rained on standpoint, uh, the sun emits a very powerful near infrared, uh, more powerful than our device uh, uh, does actually. Uh, and so at certain times a day, users do not uh, authenticate as consistently in outdoor environments. So we are uh, pretty hard line on this. Uh, we do not support uh, outdoor deployments. These are for indoor uh, use only. So, you know, uh, IT closets, data halls, high security doors, you know, uh, executive suite doors, that, that sort of stuff. But uh, indoor environments uh, only at this point. We are working on an outdoor uh, uh, reader. Uh, but uh, right now, the, the go, what we're showing you today is for, for indoor applications only. Um, anything you want to add there, Yannick? Well, I might add that uh, one of the questions is, can this work with elevators or turnstiles? Okay, uh, great question. And uh, yes, uh, so we're going to basically work just like, uh, like any other reader. So this will make a little bit more sense in two slides. I'm going to show you, uh, I'll show you a couple wiring diagrams and, and show you how this works. So. Uh, first of all, how this uh, how this is going to go uh, on our network, 
so we are going to install uh, our stone lock gateway somewhere um, uh, on the on the network. So this is either going to be a software application that gets loaded inside We Are Linux Base inside of a Ubuntu environment, uh, or you can order a hardware appliance fr from us uh, that's spun up and, and uh, has the software preloaded on there for you. Uh, so the Stonelock Gateway uh, will connect to your Secure 9000 version 2.8. Uh, and what we're going to do there is we're going to install a Windows integration service that's also included with that software uh, in that same Secure environment. So that's what's going to manage the, the traffic flow between the Secure database and ours. We are using the SDK for, for integration. Is there um, a, an annual cost to the software? Th is that a question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading you the questions as we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, there is uh, there's no hard annual cost for for the uh, for the gateway software. Uh, what we do is we have an upgrade license, which is optional. It allows you to uh, uh, jump to the latest version uh, of the Stonelock gateway. Uh, so if you're uh, if you when you get the software installed, uh, you get a year of, of updates included uh, after that install. So you can update as many times as you want. Uh, in that first year after that one year period expires uh you'll order, you'll order an upgrade license to leapfrog to the latest version uh to be able to uh to upgrade to our latest uh, and then uh, from an environment standpoint that was andrew asking the question andrew's also asking if we uh, plan to put the software in a in a cloud environment uh yes we are working on plans to uh to be uh, cloud ready uh, there's some exciting news coming that way, but uh, suffice it to say, for now, we have a VM environment available, uh, we have an, an appliance, and, and uh, that's only the, the beginning. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the integration, uh, you know, there's the, the annual is one, one question. The other one is, uh, how much does it cost to get these two platforms to talk to one another, right? The integration, uh, the integration fees, and the great news there is, when you deploy Stonelock, you're going to see Secure uh, is embedded as an option for integration partner right in the software. So from the Stonelock side, there's no license to, to activate to make Stonelock talk to Secure. From the Secure side, uh, Secure is actually uh, reselling all of this product. So you're going to order all of your readers through the software house price book. And uh, they uh, they have a, a model uh, number that they or a SKU that they've included in their price book, CC9000 Stonelock. And uh, that is the integration license that you need from Software House. But the great news there is that they have made that a $0 item. So we will do uh, no licensing fees on the Stonelock side. Secure is also going to include their CC9000 Stonelock. The reason why it's in their price book is it needs to be included on your order so that it, it'll trigger uh, their licensing department to, to send the license to make the two talk. Any uh, other questions pop up? Uh, yes, but I'm waiting for the uh, your uh, cabling slides to talk about infrastructure questions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, one question that we do get uh, quite often is, are we uh, MASS and SAS uh, compatible? How, how do we integrate there? And the answer to that is yes. We are. Uh, we can work with the MASS or we can work with the SAS. Uh, we're, we're flexible from that standpoint. So. Uh, we do get a lot of questions around GDPR and, and how can we keep our database in, in certain geographic regions. Uh, what we're doing there is we can run uh, an integration. So if a customer has, let's say, three SASs spun up for different GDPR regions, we can deploy a Stonelock gateway that connects to that SAS uh, for, for all three of those. And that keeps our information um, uh, segregated and isolated just like your secure SAS is. Uh, for GDPR compliance uh, reasons. If you, you want to have, uh, if, if we don't care about GDPR and we just want to connect to the overall system, we can connect, we can connect at the uh, mass level as well. So completely flexible uh, in, in how you want to deploy it. All right, so uh, how is this going to go together? How are we going to cable this? Uh, so from a power standpoint, we're going to use PoE uh, to power the, the device. There's, there's actually uh, a couple different ways. Uh, we've really simplified cabling, so PoE will give us power. It'll also give us communication back to our, our gateway. Um, and then in the back of the device, we have two removable terminal blocks. Uh, we have data zero, data one, and ground. Those are our Wigan terminals to speak to your ISAR panel. Uh, so when a user is authenticated, uh, we're talking device to device level. Um, we also have the ability to pull a dry contact from ISTAR 
uh, to do a lock sense. So if, if we want to, one of the problems that we have with biometrics is that when you get to a, a door and you put your fingerprint down or you, you, know, you, you do your iris or whatever the mode of authentication is, if you don't get entry into a door, you don't necessarily know, okay, did it not, not know who I was or did I just not have the right privileges to unlock the door from an access schedule standpoint? Uh, what we do with that lock sense is we're able to show the users on the display uh, our face turns green to say that we recognize a user, but if it's 501 and a user only has access until five, uh, we're able to on the screen say, yes, we, we authenticate, we know who you are, but you don't have uh, permissions to open the door right now. So there's no, no guesswork involved. Anything, Yannick, you want to add on this slide? Well, a couple of things here, just going through the question. So uh, the, uh, the cabling required here is PoE. Now we're going to talk about OSDP in a second with the next slide. So this one here is specifically with just the reader alone. Uh, from a information standpoint, the bio keys and the card readers are, uh, the card readers, the card numbers are what's kept in the stolen lock reader. Uh, so the bio keys uh, are not shared within the iStar and, and uh, we get through the integration, the card numbers assigned. So when somebody shows up with a card that doesn't have a bio key, it triggers an enrollment. Uh, if that reader is an enrollment reader. And, and after that, uh, every time we see that uh, face, we'll just spit out that card number, in this case, through Weekend. Uh, if a reader gets ripped off off the wall, there's an optical temper, and that temper will uh, basically clear all of the data on the reader. So if there's ever a problem where uh, somebody's trying to do something uh, nefarious, uh, then there's no issue. All of that data is going to be wiped uh, from the reader. Uh, so let's move to the next. The next slide is going to answer a few other questions. So I'll let you get through it, and then we'll I'll uh, comment on top. Yeah. Okay. So what what we're doing here is, um, you know, we do not embed uh, a reader technology into our faceplate. Uh, we have totally simplified that and made it a lot easier for for end users to migrate through different card technologies and to use whatever they want we get a lot of questions about you know can we work can we work with bluetooth readers can we work with myfair you know the standards are kind of constantly changing uh, as customers want to migrate through different technologies the great news with us is all of those different technologies will speak uh, from a reader standpoint either Wigand or osdp and uh, so the answer for that is let's let's use whatever the customer is comfortable with. If the customer wants to upgrade over time, they don't have to rip stone lock out, they can just replace the reader. So it's it's nice and simple to, to migrate. The other thing is we're putting these readers for the most part into applications where uh, customers already have readers and cards distributed in facilities. And so this lets us say, keep using the same infrastructure you have in place, use the same cards, the same readers, and you can just add, uh, so you know, a reader's typically what, 36 inches, off the ground, we'll put our reader just above it and, and away you go and, and we don't have to uh, get rid of anything that the customer's doing now. One thing to add to that, and uh, that was a question from George Fox, uh, will this uh, reader work, work with uh, MyFair, Desfire, EV1s with a diversified key? So the answer there is yes, right? So uh, we'll take whatever readers you guys have, that exchange of information between that reader and that card takes place there outside of our system and all we will uh, look for is an OSDP output, uh, and uh, it could be version one or two, uh, so it's a, it could be encrypted back to the RAM for us to be able to associate, a, you know, the verification of a face together with that card and make sure this is the right user. Uh, so you can bring your own uh, card readers and card to the dance. Uh, we don't discriminate that way. There you go. So uh, as far as cabling out to the door goes, uh, like, like we said, you've got your existing uh, reader cabling, uh, so you can leave that intact. You can use, you know, to Yannick's point, any reader that speaks weekend OSDP version one or two. Uh, and then the reader expansion module is you're going to run either a cat five or a cat six from the reader expansion module out to our faceplate. Um, from a, a connection back to the panel standpoint, uh, same thing. We're going to take uh, the weekend or uh, the weekend or OSDP. Uh, so this is, you know, the, the reader expansion module. We get this question: Where does it get located? Uh, most of the time, it's either going to be in the same cabinet with your iStar panel, or you know, right next to it. But technically, it can go anywhere. And you're just going to uh, run your weekend or OSDP cabling to your iStar panel, and your lock sense is going to go into the reader expansion module. 
In the previous slide, uh, those those uh, the Wiegand and the lock sense were going right in the back of the device. When you introduce a, a reader expansion module, you don't need that. Uh, you're just going to run those again, just a typically few few feet worth of wire from the reader expansion module to the iStar. Uh, yeah, what the run does here is it increases your security, right? Yeah. So it will uh, give you the ability to use OSDP. It will also uh, isolate the the network, the end user's network so that only a Go reader can connect. Uh, that connection is encrypted, so only the Go reader with the proper key can connect. And then we whitelist the address of our gateway, so we can only talk to that one gateway. So by adding this RAM, what you've done is you've ev elevated the uh, security of your system. The other thing the RAM does uh, is it provides an, an optional uh, backup, battery backup. So if you put in uh, PoE Plus, through the network, it will power the RAM and the, and the reader, as Greg was mentioning. If you put in that backup power supply, now you have a backup power in case of a problem. So, uh, so that gives you that extra layer of security. The other nice thing here is the reader could be weekend uh, or it could be OSDP, and that's independent of the connection from the RAM to the iStar. So if you're dealing with an older install where you're migrating away from an older panel that is weekend only, you could still put Wigan input uh, OSDP uh, readers and then have that last six inches uh, going from the RAM to the iStar uh, run on Wigan for an older panel and then seamlessly transition to a panel that is capable of OSDP as the time comes. So this RAM is actually uh, quite an interesting piece of equipment and it, it does increase uh, the ability for the user to uh, protect themselves. Uh, just quickly going through the questions here, uh, what happens if uh, the the power, uh, sorry, what happens if your um, network goes down, Greg? Well, so if the network goes down, uh, we're actually doing the authentication up to 10,000, your 10,000 most recent users at that reader. Uh, we're gonna do the authentication uh, at the hardware level. So it's, you know, your network could, could be unavailable, your server could be powered down with the software running on it. That's fine, you're still gonna be able to authenticate uh, locally at the device, and we're gonna be able to talk from, from device to the iStar panel directly. So one thing that's important here to note is we're not using the network to, even with the RAM, to send that information, right? So we're gonna use our own cable that's connected between the RAM and the, and the, the Go reader. Uh, so you have your latest 10,000 users. The other thing we can do as well is there's a list of uh, users that should be on every single reader out there. So if you're dealing with uh, emergency response teams uh, or, uh, or people that deal with, um, with uh, uh, maintenance, you could automatically make sure that they're all on every single reader, whether they've put their face in front of that reader or not. So the short answer is, not a whole lot goes bad if, if you lose your 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 network. You can go focus on other problems. Yep. Yeah. The experience at the door doesn't change. Correct. Any? Uh, I see a couple of question marks, but I don't have access to the the questions pane. So. Yeah, we're we're dealing with them as they come. There is a question here that we have not addressed yet uh, from Bruno Perez. Uh, thanks for a good question, Bruno. Um, can we use the equipment to read QR codes for our, for visitors? So the answer is yes. We can. Uh, there's a there's a QR code reader in, in the device. Uh, we generate the QR code. We could also, depending on on the visitor management system you use, uh, we could also figure out a way to get that number that GUID through integration. Uh, so we could uh, take that one offline to make sure um, we are uh, we're okay to go with uh, a visitor management system you might have connected to to Secure. But in general terms, the answer is yes, we can use a QR code for visitors. And that's actually a great use of our system. Very cost effective because the barcode's included. Any uh, any other questions you wanna to touch on before we keep going? The, the QR code one is a, is a really nice piece because in our software, we can toggle on an option, which is to use the QR code as a credential as well, which we didn't really touch on. And what it allows you to do, when I, when I just showed you an enrollment, there's two ways to do it. You present your card or you present your QR code and follow the prompts on the screen. If you're not using your QR as a credential, that QR, once you've enrolled, basically becomes, it's like a self-destruct. It, it just becomes useless after that. But if you decide you can actually save that uh, that user, you can make them a, a two-factor user with QR. And when they enroll with their QR, after that, they can save that to their Apple Wallet or their Google Pay. And now you can do two-factor authentication without actually having to give that user a, uh, a physical credential. 
any other questions you want to touch on? There you go. Yannick's got his. Actually, Yannick's got his. I got my QR in my Apple wallet right there. So anytime I get close to my house, my phone tells me I got my credential for my reader. Right. Well, I'm pointing there as if you can see it, but <laughs> there's a reader right there. Yeah, that, that's a really cool application, Yannick Scott. Like if you've ever traveled through the airport and you have the mobile boarding pass, magically you get near the airport and then the the, the boarding pass just appears on your home screen. And, and Yannick's got the uh, the exact same setup uh, with uh, how he saved the, that QR with his Apple Wallet. So it's just, hi Yannick, here's your Stonelock ID. And then, you know, when he, and it's only when he's he's at his actual house. And when he swipes, uh, he can present his QR code and and away you go. And when he's not near his house, it doesn't, doesn't appear on his home screen. Um, so all of these parts uh, that uh, that we talked about, putting a quote together with Stonelock is uh, is extremely simple. Um, there's only a few part numbers that we actually require to put a quote together. Uh, we have uh, our reader, uh, which is the uh, STL Go here. Uh, so you know if you, if you're going to do uh, a reader that let's say has a, a hundred a system, I should say that has a hundred readers on it. There's not really a lot of part numbers. You're going to first of all you're going to determine. Uh, what kind of gateway do we want? Do we want to use a software gateway or do we want to use the hardware appliance? So you're either going to use uh, the GWI SW for software, GWI HW for hardware. Uh, and then uh, you're going to decide, do we want to add a third party reader? Like we talked about there, there's MyFair, um, uh, it could be Weekend, it could be any, any third party reader. Uh, if you do, uh, you're going to add the reader expansion module, which is down here at the bottom. And then, uh, and then you have the the Go Reader. So three part numbers, and then the only other thing you have to make sure that you include is uh, if you for your integration is the CC9000 Stonelock, but that's a zero dollar value um, uh, item. So to put a, a quote together again, like I was saying, 100 readers with with uh, reader expansion modules, you're just going to do reader expansion module times 100, Go Reader times 100. You know, choose your hardware or software gateway times one, and then your your seek your integration license, and away you go. So really easy to put a quote together. Greg, I'd like to correct you. This is a really high value item. It's a zero cost item. Well, what did I say? Zero value. <laughs> did I say zero value? I said no, zero dollar. No. It's a zero dollar value. value. It's super valuable. It's Yes, it's priceless. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to call you out, but it is very valuable. <laughs> it is priceless. It's very definitely important. needed. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you for uh, for the correction. Uh, and uh, Kelsey, anything that you wanted to add on the on the the pricing slide? Nope, you covered it. I was going to just make a mention about the integration uh, part number, but you covered it for me. So perfect. I guess one one thing to mention. Um, so for any integrators or um, JCI personnel on here, so we did come out with a revised uh, price book for 2020 back in January. Um, unfortunately, we weren't quick enough to go ahead and get these part numbers added in. So they'll go into our next rev of the price book that's coming out in the spring. However, everything is live in our in our actual systems for ordering. So all you have to do is just work with your local ASM. They all have the part numbers, they've seen them, um, and they can put together a quote and process an order. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, so just a couple of applications because we always get this question when we do our presentations, you know, what doors are you seeing the the product being installed on? And I see a few more questions that popped up. Uh, we'll get to those as well. Um, so the the big verticals uh, for us right now, it's it's honestly been all over the map. Uh, there's been three primary, uh, which has been, you know, data centers have been very big. We seem, see that it seems like there's a lot of data centers out there that have, you know, uh, dozens if not hundreds of uh, biometric readers that are deployed that are contact based and right now people are working on like what is our back to work schedule and eliminating those those common touch points like a, a reader that you actually physically come in contact with uh, is, has become a priority so we're seeing that uh, with with uh, data centers they, they tend to have a large quantity of them and then financial and medical also similar in a, in a similar boat um, uh, in these scenarios, you've got you know very high dollar value assets, so high security doors uh, that were uh, that were securing there. Uh, and then inside of a facility, we we're finding that these are going on three types of doors. Uh, you have your high security doors; it, it tends to dominate. We get you know most of the readers are going on high security doors. 
there has been a, a second category that we call convenience doors, which is uh, you know executive suite doors, people that don't want to you know carry cards, uh, uh, boardroom doors. You want to show that you've got you know the latest technology when you're bringing clients in to do presentations. So convenience doors where you, you just want to be able to basically approach your door unlock and, and, and through you go. And then uh, the third type we, we call choke points, which is, you know, somebody asked a question about turnstiles. You know, the great part about a turnstile at the front of a, of a building is something that we don't really often talk about is card cloning. You, you hear that discussed somewhat. Card sharing is something that, that doesn't really get brought up very often. So what we could do is if we put this at a choke point, like a turnstile at the front of a, of a building, if a user is forced at that choke point to use card plus face, we can at least ensure that when they arrived at the site, that the user who presented their card was the user you assigned that card to. And then once they get inside, they can maybe just use card only, but you've now brought up the entire level of security for the entire building because we've ensured that you know people are, are coming in with a, a card that, that you assigned to them, not something that they borrowed from somebody else. So this one is also a really high value proposition, of course. You a couple of readers will increase everywhere's uh, everyone's security across the campus. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, is there any questions before we we jump in, or like the, the last part, or, or more on no, the order? No, we've covered most of the all the questions so far. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be uh, sold by Software House. So to Kelsey's point earlier, uh, you're going to work through your Software House channel that you're you're familiar with and, and working with today. The licensing, like I said, it is included, but you do need to make sure that 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 priceless uh, zero cost high value line item is in the price is in the quote, and then that'll that'll trigger them to send you the license that you need. Um, like I said before, we have, uh, from a software standpoint, you can either order the software and you can put it, uh, we do support VMs, so you can, you can drop it in a virtual environment if you're using Hyper-V, VMware, VirtualBox, uh, whatever you want. Um, and then from the Stonelock side, you'll see, uh, uh, Secure is, is actually embedded right in our interface. You just select that as, as, as your option. Um, from a, uh, technical support standpoint, we are working with, uh, Secure on this as well. Uh, we have a unique relationship with Software House in that not, not only are they uh, taking our product and reselling it, but they're also supporting it. So they've, they've launched this like it's a, a house brand. Uh, so we are going through uh, right now, I was just talking to Kelsey, through technical support training with their, their teams. And uh, so when you're calling for support on this, uh, they'll be able to walk you through level one and level two tech support uh, on the product, uh, which is pretty powerful considering you know a lot of times when you call in for tech support with integrated systems there's a lot of back and forth and you have to call you know company a once and then they'll point you to company b and then company b says no no no, it's company a and there's a lot of that back and forth that, that kills a lot of tech labor hours uh so so secure is actually uh, stepping up with uh, the support on this this product as well um there are a, a mixture of people on the call from, from end users to integrators uh, to um, uh, Secure Regional. So if you do have any, uh, any additional questions, I want to make sure you, you had our contact info uh, for our, our inside sales team. Um, we have got uh, this set up to be able to do uh, live demos. So if you have uh, customers that you think would be interested in this and in, in doing a one-on-one -on -one session with those, uh, send us a request there. We, we'd be more than happy to facilitate that. Uh, give them a live demo, walk them through how it would exactly work on, on their system on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. Yannick, anything you want to add? Well, I wanted to thank you for a great demo and thank you uh, to everybody else uh, to for participating. Uh, Kelsey, yes, thank, thank you very much for having us on this call today. Absolutely, and I actually had one question that um, we see sometimes with um, with the card plus face question in in that if the card doesn't match with the face right so you're in a scenario where somebody's kind of coming in behind somebody um, they utilize that person in front of them's card they've already been authenticated via their card and their face this person however right the card is authenticated but the face is not is it still going to allow access based on the card and just report back to secure that a mismatch between the biometric and the card Actually, well, so there. let's unwrap that. There's a lot of good points in here that I want to make. So uh, one, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't let somebody else come in uh, because it's really one face, one card, and that's the match we make. We also have a uh, an ability to 
figure out uh, if we haven't, uh, if this card doesn't match this face, it will actually let you know whose card it was that this should have matched. So we'll know if that person has been enrolled before, we'll know Greg uh, used the Annex card. And that's an event that will be available for Secure. Uh, one of the nice things we're doing over the, the period of the next month is we're rolling out a version three level integration where we're going to be spitting out those events right into the Secure Journal. So uh, all of that information will be uh, uh, available even on an, on an, an unauthorized use of a card and face. Uh, so great question, Kelsey. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for answering. All right. So we um, we have a couple more minutes here. Um, so I just want to again thank the Stonelock team, Greg and Yannick. Thank you so much. Uh, for this great presentation as well as uh, the wonderful demo. Um, you know, we're super excited to launch this into our software house product portfolio as an offering. So really glad that you guys were able to uh, participate in today's webinar with me. Thank you. And thank you to all the attendees as well for taking time out of your day. I know everybody's busy, um, especially now with the pandemic and, you know, making making new moves here. Um, so really appreciate everybody taking the time and joining today's webinar. And I hope uh, that we've empowered you with enough information to go ahead and bye, bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Kelsey. We really, really appreciate the support. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Take care.